Hello there. So in this video, we're going to do our very first topic in our very first unit of macroeconomics, which is um, the unit is measuring economic performance. And, and the first topic is gross domestic product. Gross meaning total, domestic meaning what you make in your country, and product meaning stuff. And so before we kind of even get into that, like the specifics of like, why are we care about this thing called gross domestic product and all that, kind of let's take the 30,000 feet level and think about um, macroeconomic goals. Macros is the Greek word meaning uh, large. And so we'd say large economy goals. Um, and so thinking about it, not from the question of like how many workers should one firm hire or what's the wage that's gonna get paid by that firm, which is what we learned in the very last unit of microeconomics, um, but more big picture stuff. So we have kind of three big goals that political economy or just economics, the old name for economics, we had a goal to achieve. And the first goal is stable, low increases in price levels. And notice that I say levels here, that's important. And we'd say not to zero. And it'll become apparent later why I'm like, ah, eh, zero is not good. Uh, second goal would be stable, low unemployment rates. And that's again, not to zero. And that will become apparent next, uh, next topic actually. And this third thing, uh, stable increases in output, that's actually this topic. And so um, this is the value of GDP is in fact what that is. So we want GDP, gross domestic product or output to go up. Um, and the reason why, and, and I don't wanna to spend too much time on this question, but, but I think it's valuable here is to say that it's one of the ways that we can define something called standard of living. And really I like to say that economics is about trying to make people's lives better. When we talk about this stable increases in output, what we're really meaning there is that we take all the value of all the goods and services an economy produces we divide it by the number of people in that country, and we could say that's roughly the standard of living. Um, it's not perfect, right? And in fact, in this very topic in GDP, we'll talk about where it's not perfect, um, but it's a good approximation, at least it's, it's one that, that most people have agreed on for how well, is, uh, how well is the standard of living in a particular country. So again, there's, there's things you can beef with it about, right? You know, but, but in general, this is kind of going to be our central question is how's the GDP doing and are we making more stuff than we made previously? Um, and again, with, with some asterisks on that. Now, in order to assess kind of how we're doing on the goals, economists create these things called national accounts. And it might be useful to just tell you this is very new. This is only since really World War II, we've created these kind of accounting measures. We keep the books. Um, so unemployment really dates to only really World War II. Um, inflation rates have only been really measured since the 20th century. And GDP, likewise, was invented really in the 1930s and 1940s. Someone sat down and said, uh, his name is Simon Kuznets, he sat down and said, let's figure out a good way to measure the amount of output. So, um, so these national accounts, they're created. And we use a model called the circular flow in particular um, to look at things like output. And so we're going to start with that model that think about the whole economy, and then we can kind of work from there. So, um, so we'll kind of get started here. I already talked about that. This is a fancy picture, but it's not, not as super easy to build from here. So we're gonna start with this, and I'm just gonna tell you, we're gonna add things to it. So we wanna kind of leave ourselves some space. Now, in, in the most basic national economy, you basically got two players, right? You think about two, two kind of groups of people, or not even really people. You've got at the top, you have households. And so these are individuals, these are families, these are folks like you and me. And at the bottom, we're gonna say that there are firms. Now we know that firms are really just made up of people as well, um, but you know, for our purposes, we'll say that they kind of behave as a separate actor in this, in this, in this crazy uh, model of our whole economy. And then we've got two markets. And we actually learned about these two markets last semester. We have the factor market, which is what we learned in the very last unit of last semester. And we have the product market. And again, I'm gonna encourage you, leave a little bit of space for yourself to draw some arrows and things. We're gonna add some things onto this. Now, we call it the circular flow because it's actually modeling the flow of money in the economy. And so households earn income from the factor market. Remember, it's like the labor market. So we would say that money kind of flows to the households and that's the income. And we, say, we would say that the firms pay money into the factor market. That's where they hire workers from. Well, what do these households do? Well, in the most basic model, they spend all their money. Um, now, we know that they don't. We're going to come back to that. But for right now, we'll just say they spend all their money 
in the product market. And well, who gets that money? Well, the, the, fa- the firms, right? The firms get that money. And so we'll just kind of slide that money back. Now, notice the money is flowing in a circular pattern, it's the name circular flow. Now, this is basically how we can figure out output in the economy, actually, because if we just pause the flow for a moment, right? Like uh, three, two, one, pause. Pausing the flow allows us to basically, if you count up the dollars that are flow, oh man, that was terrible. If I, if I like count up the dollars in one corner, that's the amount of output, right? So this, this dollar amount here, and, and by the way, it should be equal to the dollar amount over here. Like if we kind of think about that all the dollars stay in it, then the amount here is the same amount as here. Now we're gonna add a little bit more to this. There is a third agent in all of this called the government. And we know that the government, government, we know that the government does hire people in the factor market, right? That's, that's pretty clear. And they also buy things in the product market. So we'll kind of say here, money flows into the product market like that. And if, and if you want, you know, you can draw more arrows and lines of this thing and make it really exciting. But for our purposes right now, we've got kind of three agents. We've got households, firms, and government, and the two markets, product market and factor market. And if we start to kind of add some labels on here that we can also add a couple of other things and ideas. Now, the first measure of, of output is kind of called the income approach. And we would say that if you add it up, this is over here, if you add up all the money that flows from the factors into the households, that, that households get paid wages, households earn interest, household earn rent, because if you own property, right, you'd, you'd get rent and you'd get profit. Now, the, this is a little weird, but they're getting the profit by owning the firms. We talked about that at the beginning that firms aren't like just independent, they're owned by households. And so if you own a firm, you get income from it, that counts as profit. So there are four kind of components of income. And if we add those four together, we get GDP. That's literally GDP is this, this one measure. If we add those four things together, wages, rent, interest, and profit, or rip, right? Now, the second thing is gonna require us to add a couple of the arrows here. Now, this money, when it's flowing from households into the product market, is called consumption. We said, you know, you spend all your money, that's called consumption. And when government spends money, well, we don't have a fancy name for it. We just call it government spending, right? Government spending. And then the third kind of spending that does happen, I didn't add it initially, is when firms spend money. Because firms spend money on, on products as well, right? Firms don't just hire workers. Um, sometimes they buy cash registers, right? Think about that ice cream shop. It's got to buy stuff, right, to make the ice cream, the scoops and the cash registers and all that stuff. And so that money sometimes will flow back in there. And we call that when firms spend money on kind of things like machinery and tools and, and buildings, we call that investment spending, right? Because what they're really doing is investing in their, their capacity to earn income. Um, so, so when we talk about investments in this class, this is brief, maybe the first time we've used this word, I don't use this word to refer to stock market investing, will not refer to stock market investing that way. In fact, this, this is the last time you'll hear me say that phrase. Investment in this class only means one thing. It means when firms spend money on new machines, um, new buildings, um, that, that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean um, putting money into the stock market. That's a totally separate thing. Now, if we add the money that's flowing into the product market, right? The consumption, the investment, and the government spending, that's another way, right? That's all of this money flowing back to the firms. That's another way that we can say consumption. I'm not going to rewrite all of these words. I'm just going to abbreviate investment and government spending. That's another way we can say GDP. So there's two approaches to calculating GDP. You can do the income or you can count up all the spending, right? Now, in this picture, there's some leaks that I kind of skipped over. And I want to just basically mention them because they will come back to us later. This whole semester, we're going to be basically looking at the picture we just drew. Um, the first leak is that some households pay taxes and some get transfers from the government, right? So the government, as we talked about briefly last semester, they set up tax systems, progressive, regressive, proportional, blah, blah. And so money sometimes flows from the households over to the government. We didn't put that in there, but that, that is a feature. And we would say that, you know, households, when they get this income, if we subtract taxes and we add in transfers, that's what we call their disposable income. And so some part of that disposable income becomes consumption. But we know that in reality, firms are, sorry, households 
also will save some money. So that's why I put here that you know there there is this this leak in the circular flow model called the the savings, right? And and that savings goes into a third market that we're actually going to introduce in this class called the financial market. And then that market, right, some of that savings goes to the government because the government borrows money. And sometimes that money goes to firms because they borrow money, right? So, so there's a little bit more complexity here. Um, we, spent, we said that in the third part, the government gets funds from taxes on firms, households, blah, blah, blah. Fourth thing that we aren't going to put on this picture, but it's kind of come to us later in this semester, is the open economy. And that's a fancy way of saying that, you know, the whole world also has a product market and a factor market and a financial market. There's a global financial market and a domestic one. There's a global factor market and a domestic one. And there's a global product market with imports and exports and a domestic one. So we're going to look at that stuff in unit five. So as the semester goes on, we're going to add more kind of things to this picture, um, not literally, but kind of more figuratively. Now, for this particular, this is a really, see, I told you it looked like spaghetti, right? We don't want to draw spaghetti. But this is, I think, a useful way of thinking about all the different directions, right? The rest of the world, the financial markets. It's a cool little graphic. It's in your textbook um, where they walk you through all the little details of it. I, I like just kind of following around the little path, right? So anyways, uh, now we're going to get really deep dive into the two methods of counting uh, GDP. We've got this method, right? The spending approach where we count up all the money that gets spent. And we have the second method called the income approach. So the first one is, is we'll do is spending. Now, GDP, I'm just going to define it clearly for you here. It is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. Now, there are a few key words on here um, that I'm going to point out to you. Final, that means that it's only things that are like the final sale of it. It's not like an, what we sometimes call an intermediate good, um, which means like, you know, if you buy a brand new car, well, it's not, it's only the value of the car. It's not when the maker of the car spent money on the transmission and the tires and all those, in, those other intermediate things. It's just the final market value of the car itself. It also includes things like services. So we sometimes forget services are a big part of the economy. Another piece of this is that they have to be produced in that current time period, right? The given year. So it wouldn't include something made three or four or five years ago. And it has to be within the country. It doesn't matter who made it within the country, um, but it does have to be within that country. Now, there are four components of this spending approach to calculating all of the market value of all final goods and services. They are consumption, investment, government, and net exports. Now up here, right, I just said consumption, investment, government because we didn't draw the open economy, but let's be real, there are things called imports and exports. So um, the first one, consumption, and, I, and I've given you the definition here. This is household purchases, purchases of new, final goods and services. Um, and it includes, right, things like um, rents, leases, and commissions. So this is kind of difficult, but I've actually included three things here that, that students often don't think about. Like if you're renting an apartment, it gets counted in there. Um, if you're leasing a car, it gets counted in there as a service actually. Commissions gets counted, like if you have a, a, a broker, a stock broker earning commissions or a real estate agent earning commissions, um, you're paying that money as a service. So we count that in there. Um, it, it, obviously a new haircut, um, you know, any, anything new, um, a new package of pens, all that stuff. As long as it's purchases by the households, it's included in there. This is by far the largest component of the US economy. The second is business purchases, and this is what we call investment purchases of new equipment, new equipment, um, new construction. And this is true for any construction. So maybe we'll put there any new construction and changes in inventories. Now, the two that, that students are sometimes thrown off by are any new construction and changes in inventories. And so it, it doesn't matter if like a household is gonna live in the house, if it's brand new construction of a house, it counts as investment spending. Um, there are complex reasons for why, if you really care, you can ask me during class. Uh, change in inventories is another one that students often forget, but really all three of these represent basically future income. So if your inventory at the beginning of the year is, uh, or sorry, at the, at the end of the year is larger than it was at the beginning of the year, 
then you have an increase in investment spending. So there would be an addition to investment. So if at the beginning of the year, you had five brand new cars on the lot, at the end of the year, you had 12, the difference, the value of the seven new cars that's added to your inventory gets added as investment spending. Um, if you have less inventory, then it decreases investment spending. And that's actually because we're kind of using it as a way of like accounting for production that happened in a given year, but didn't necessarily get changed around. And it's really more of an accounting thing than anything else that we included. Any new equipment also gets counted here in investment spending, um, but it does not include intermediate goods. So if you're a bakery, right, you're making donuts, it doesn't include the price of the flour that you use to make the donuts. It doesn't include the sugar. Um, it doesn't include all those little parts that you use to make the product. It's only the final good or service that gets counted. Now, if you're a bakery and you bought a new oven, you're the final user of it and it's new equipment, so it gets counted. Right. So that's that's a tricky part. No intermediate goods get counted. For this. Third, and this one's relatively easier, I think, is government purchases of new goods and services. So the government can spend money and if they buy a new aircraft carrier, that counts, right? So that's cool. Uh, if they have government employees, that counts, right? So that's any of those things count. Uh, net exports, and these are the, um, the value, value of exported, export goods and services minus imports. So it's really all that other stuff, but it's the exports minus the imports. We call it net exports. By the way, these are abbreviated C, I, G, and X sub N. And so we use capital C, capital I, capital G, capital X sub N. Now, the bottom part here is the income approach. I'm not gonna spend it as much time going through these. Um, wages is payment for, for work. Um, so that one's relatively self-explanatory. Rent is factor income that goes to land and capital. And by the way, if you've noticed, I, I never use the C to abbreviate capital because we always use it for consumption. Um, so that's labor income, that's land and capital income. The interest would be if you earned from a loan, right? So if you earned money from a loan, that counts as income. And on this side, by the way, it would count as a service, right? So that's kind of thinking all of the dollars that we count here will get basically, you could figure them out on the spending side too. And profit is usually from corporations, from corporations. And so like if a corporation earns dividends, dividends on a stock, that counts as income because a stock is a share of ownership in the company. And if you earn what's called a dividend, that's actually your share of the company's profit. So I own, for example, a share of Microsoft. I have it in my Robinhood account. And every few months, they just deposit 50 cents into my account. That's my share of Microsoft's um, corporate profits. And so we count that as income. Okay. Now we're going to wrap up this lecture with four common exclusions from GDP. I have harped on this one numerous times in this lecture. Intermediate goods are not included. So that's a really tricky one, they're not included. So we call them non-final. Non-productive activities are also not counted. So used goods are not counted because we've already counted them once, right? So if it's used, we don't count it. Um, so goodwill doesn't really add a whole lot of economic activity to our, our economy, garage sales, yard sales, they don't add any GDP in, in the sense of economic activity. Financial assets, the value of the asset itself doesn't count. So maybe we'd say here, like, X nay on stocks, bonds, and land, right, or real estate. So the, this is tricky because, you know, bond here, this is the income from a loan or a bond. That gets counted. The profit that comes from the stock gets counted, but not the value of the stock, bond, or real estate itself, right? So it's not like, it's not, if I went out and I bought a share of Microsoft, it's going to cost about $200. That doesn't get added to GDP, but every time I get a little bit of their profit, that does. Third, non-market activities. And there's a ton of these out here, black market, homemade products, government transfers. So if they just give you money, like when the government just gives a social security check, that's not the government buying a new good or a service, right? So be very careful. There are lots of little ins and outs to this. The last one is international activities, unless they're an import or export. So um, for example, I sometimes have students who maybe a mom or a dad or somebody, they work in another country, 
if they work and live in another country, all of that gets counted for that country's GDP. It doesn't matter the nationality of the person, it matters where they are. So if you have immigrants, for example, in the United States and they're producing things, they get counted for the United States. But if you have Americans living in France, they count for France. Um, so unless it's imported or exported, it doesn't count. All right, we're gonna do some practice that'll help you kind of isolate which ones are counted and which ones aren't. Thank you for taking good notes. I'll see you next time.